Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try and be diligent and uh, keep you uh, no longer than, than you want to be. Um, so uh, before I begin, I want to make a little bit of a plug. Next month on December 12th, at the same time, Jessica Berg from Case Western will be speaking on charity care obligations and tax-exempt hospitals. Time for a change. Uh, we would love for all of you to attend that event if you are able. Uh, so my name is Avi Don Cover. I teach at Case Western. And I wanted to speak to you today uh, about the topic of how judges, in particular, uh, deal with fear, uh, how they make findings in the realm of very scary areas, in particular terrorism, uh, and what might be done about that, how we can read these opinions, and what that says about our society in general. Um, so there's go I've delved into fairly recently a lot of social science uh, in this area. There's been a lot on that. And um, it's possible that some of you uh, may have even been exposed to some of this. Perhaps some of you have been to the Science Museum. Last year, there was a wonderful exhibit at the Science Museum about fear, uh, about the way it works, about how we register it and perceive it in our brain. There is an uh, element of our brain, the amygdala, uh, which um, operates in our brain and senses fear. Fear need not and indeed uh, should not often be a bad thing, right? We need fear. We need to register fear, right? Our bodies are hardwired that way. We smell smoke, right? Our amygdala tells us something. There might be fire. We might do something about it, right? You go back in time, early man, um, a sense of predators around, right? There's something in your brain that registers. There's a threat, and I need to do something about that, right? So we understand fear can be a good thing. Um, so wonderful exhibit. You can go through all of these things. And in one place, down in the, the bottom floor of the Science Museum, there was this room that you could enter. And you could expose yourself to certain fears right? and see how you deal with them. And you were to register on some sort of apparatus what level or what degree of fear you felt. And there was a little box uh, for one item. And inside the box was uh, a spider, or at least what appeared to be a spider. Uh, show of hands, how many people have a fear of spiders? A couple. All right, so that, that's actually close to uh, maybe a little under, actually. I don't know how it plays out with lawyers, but uh, a little under uh, the understood uh, averages of fears of spider. About one in three persons right, usually identifies some level of fear of spiders. Well, I count myself in that uh, brave minority or, or cowardly minority, perhaps. Um, and so uh, the goal of what you were supposed to do was there was this little box, a uh, clear box, and black felt or something uh, that you had to put your hand through to touch the spider. And I was utterly paralyzed. I, I couldn't do it. Um, and in fact, I left sort of sheepishly and said, all right, it's time to go. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute. I, I, I've got to go back in there. Because my intuition, my initial reaction was, well, this is dangerous. This is a spider. Right? But then my reasoning faculty, my more deliberative side, the side that hopefully plays out when I'm functioning as a lawyer more often, right, said, that can't be a real spider. This is a science museum. Families come. Children come. How many people are touching this spider? Right? That would be dangerous. That would be gross. And so I reached in, and I put my hands around the object. And sure enough, all I felt was sterile, inanimate plastic. Right? I had overcome my fear and realized my assessment was somewhat off. Right? What we're going to talk about a little bit today is risk assessment, basically. Right? Risk is defined as essentially harm times probability. Right? There is a, a danger of something occur, some sort of loss. And we're looking at what is the likelihood of that loss occurring. Right? The risk of a terrible hurricane befalling New York City and New Jersey. Right? The risk of some sort of disease. Uh, subjecting people to harm. The risk of, uh, and a far more serious subject than the subject of today, the risk of terrorism. And when we talk about uh, terrorism, obviously I think the analysis has changed after 9-11. Right? Before 9-11, people did not think about terrorism in the same way. We did not allocate the same level of resources. Uh, and indeed, there were, of course, many investigations. And most famously, the 9-11 Commission report concluded the 9-11 attacks revealed failures in imagination. Right? And the recriminations followed. We were asleep. We were on the watch. We weren't focused enough on terrorism. 
President Bush said shortly after the attacks, no one could have conceivably imagined suicide bombers burrowing into our society and then emerging all in the same day to fly their aircraft, fly US aircraft into buildings full of innocent people and show no remorse. Um, and so after 9-11, there was sort of a reorientation of our society, of our government, of everyone's mindset. Right? There was more of a focus on government. Attorney General Ashcroft said, no longer is the first priority of the Department of Justice prosecution of terrorism, it is prevention of terrorism. Right? There was going to be a greater effort, a greater movement toward prediction. Um, and, and of course then, many things followed from that. Um, and we emerged into what some people have called the national surveillance state. And I'm not making any normative uh, statement here, no, no judgment, right? There are a lot of reasons to be in a national surveillance state. Um, and indeed, it is not simply a reaction to terrorism, right? There have been incredible technological developments and innovations in our society, right? Now it is much easier for the leader of the CIA's secret correspondence with his paramour to be discovered because we live in a national surveillance state. Right? You can, we have data, and it, we, have, we leave a record. And so we have better capability of surveilling people through satellites. We have better ability of going through data mining and going through thousands and millions and millions and millions in bytes of data. Right? But the government also changed. We created new departments, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of National Intelligence. Huge amounts of resources were allocated to agencies, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA became much more at the forefront of the fight on terrorism than had been the FBI. Why? The CIA is not focused on terrorism. The CIA is focused on prevention. It is focused on intelligence. And with that, however, certain things come about. When you move to a more intelligence and prevention focused society, the concern, right, and, and rightly or wrongly, is that some standards are going to, of evidence, of suspicion, are going to be reduced. And there is going to be greater dialogue. One of the, one of the great criticisms of 9-11 was that the FBI and CIA were not speaking. Some people are questioning that now in what wake of the Petraeus uh, scandal issues, whether there has been sufficient dialogue. But undoubtedly, certain walls, literally, came down. Other approaches were made, right? The national surveillance state said, if we're going to predict, what kind of standard are we going to use? What was famously uh, termed the 1% doctrine that uh, Vice President Cheney articulated was, if there is a 1% chance of something calamitous that's going to happen, we need to do something about it. And underlying and, and following from that rationale were also certain actions that have been characterized as torture, right, or assassinations. Right? So we had Guantanamo. We had interrogation techniques that, again, some have labeled as torture. We have drones in which we assassinate individuals. All of this is part of the national surveillance state. But I want to stress, it, again, it is not simply a reaction to terrorism. Right? A great example of that is the drones right? and the implications that it has for our society. At the outset, 9-11, the US military had only a few, a handful of drones, unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles. Ten years later, there are 10,000 drones operating by the US military and the CIA. But where it comes into play in our society, in our domestic sphere, and where it can present other civil liberties issues, is now drones are being operated domestically. Right? And so what does that portend for law enforcement, for agricultural approaches right, that are being utilized with drones? So the society will change. There is a seeping into it. And scholars who have talked about national surveillance state identify two problems. So one is you have this parallel track where essentially the law does not apply, right? Guantanamo, right? It was, it was sort of an argument where at least efforts were made by the government, right? That's why detainees were brought there. This notion was the law is not going to apply there. Secret sites, what have you, things that are done under law. And the other concern that people have had is that that ethos, that lack of law, though that uh, dilution of standards will seep into our domestic criminal justice system. Um, and so the question that we have before us is how should the courts handle this? What, what is the court's role when presented with a risk, right? potential harm and probability? And one view historically has been the court defers. Right? It's, it's an issue of war, it's an issue of national security. Who is the court to step in 
and, and replace its judgment for that of the executive and the Congress. Um, but what about civil liberties? Right? What about certain minorities who may be targeted under this new approach? Um, and so scholars who look at dealing with threats characterize uh, two approaches. Uh, one is really a corollary of the other. One is the precautionary principle, which to some extent sounds a lot like the 1% doct doctrine. Action should be taken to correct a problem as soon as there's evidence that harm might occur. Um, that sounds sort of intuitively right, right? Better safe than sorry. Um, and the anti-catastrophe principle, a, a corollary to that essentially is, when we're not certain about something, we should figure out what's the worst case scenario that might occur, and we're going to follow an approach that eliminates that. So again, there, there's, there's a, a fairly, at least surface appeal to that. Uh, that, that seems commonsensical. But the problem, of course, is um, what sort of evidence do you need to justify this sort of action? Right? What, 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 what's the threshold before we take action? Right? There's also the notion that, on, on one level, some people have said, this is absurd. Because uh, whenever you take an action, right, you are, you're going to cause a whole new set of, of courses of, of events to take place, right? sort of a butterfly effect. If you don't act, there are certain consequences. Um, how certain do we have to be of the risk before we take uh, action? What is the, who has the burden of proof right, in terms of going on this approach? Um, but the, the real problem, I think, and what uh, is going to be much of the subject of my discussion today, is that we are, as a general rule, really bad at predicting harm. Um, and I'm going to talk about two cognitive errors that behavioral scientists have identified when dealing with risk assessments. Uh, one is called the availability heuristic. Right? Heuristic is sort of a shorthand, a way that we think about things. And what people often do right, is you make an assessment of risk based on what's available to you, right? what you've seen on TV, what your friend just told you. Right? I mean, how many of you probably have you know, predicted or said the likelihood of something is X because you heard it on television, you read it in the news, a friend told you, right? which might be a reputable source, but it might well not be. Right? And the second is probability neglect, which is particularly when you're facing a fearful event, you tend to disregard the likelihood. And, and it need not be actually that you, you might exaggerate the significance, you might actually uh, minimize the significance. Probability neglect can work both ways. Um, so let's get a little bit more into the details of that availability heuristic. Right, a classic example is the summer of the shark. Right? A couple of shark uh, attacks on a beach, say, around Tampa, Florida, and suddenly, don't go into the ocean. Right? And people are changing their vacation plans. People are choosing not to swim based on TV coverage, based on this information. Statistically, there may have been no deviation right, in the shark attacks. Right? If you're just as safe going into the water, particularly, say, if the shark attack were in Tampa, and you're going into the water in Cape Cod, um, you know, you're, you're not going to look at those same risks. Right? But we immediately make these judgments based on what's available to us. And we will put some concerns at the forefront. So there's not as much attention to putting on sunblock and sunscreen. My primary concern at the beach is, I'm not going to go in the water. Jaws is there. Right? But I forget about applying sunscreen. Um, and so to be sure, of course, also what affects us with the availability heuristic is what uh, social scientists term the salience of the event. Right? The more horrific, the more vivid. You see an image of someone who's been bitten by a shark, that is going to stay with you. And that is going to have a far deeper impression on you in terms of what you predict are the risks of being bitten by a shark. Right? When are we more likely to buy flood insurance? Right after a flood, right? Now, putting climate change aside for a moment, generally speaking, right, just because the flood occurred doesn't mean that floods are more likely to occur. But you have just been through that experience or just read of that experience. And so the availability heuristic kicks in and says, I better get flood insurance. And indeed, it affects people who live quite far from, say, in this instance, New York and New Jersey. Similarly with earthquakes, right? You live near the San Andreas Fault. Nothing's happened for a while. You're not interested in earthquake in insurance. Boom! Earthquake hits. You're calling your insurer. Right? It makes sense. It's logical. 
Um, but, but that plays out in a lot of ways. Probability neglect, right? Very similar to uh, the availability, availability heuristic, right? We are affected by awful traumatic events. Um, who here is afraid of driving? Who here is afraid of flying? All right, a few hands. Um, any, what, are, what are the odds in your lifetime of dying in a plane crash? Any guesses? Minimal. Minimal. One in 20,000, which actually is higher than I had realized. But, 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 um, but in your lifetime, in your life. One in 20, <laughs> but what's the likelihood of your dying, dying in a car? in your lifetime? 25 times greater. What's, <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. 25 times greater. 25 times greater. I'm bad at math. Um, but but, but I, I guess folks, one in 100, right, right? It's a far greater likelihood to die in a car accident in your lifetime than in a plane, right? But we continually, and in part because we're scared of that image and we're not sure that Captain Sully is going to be there to rescue you and steer the plane, right, we're more afraid of flying. <laughs> Right. Similarly, a fascinating study that was done with participants. They asked people, um, participants in a study, you've got $20 we're giving you, right? And we are going to maybe shock you. It's an electric shock, right? And there's a 1% chance you'll be shocked, a 99% chance, a 100% chance. How much will you pay to avoid the shock at 1%? And the median response was $7. 99% chance you will be shocked. Median response was $10. Right? Participants are asking another study. We are going to take $20 away from you. There's a 1% chance we will take the $20 away, a 99%, a 100% chance. How much will you pay to avoid the 1% chance that we will take your $20 away? People answered $1. A 99% chance, median response, $18. Right? The latter, this economic possible in people's risk evaluations, is sort of more sensible, right? It follows the financial and the numbers. But when dealing with a shock, a far more sort of frightening possible outcome, people's probability assessments were skewed, right? They tilted up. The 1% chance still registered $7, and 99% people were only going to pay $10. So we're dealing here, and I don't mean to in any way minimize the significance of car accidents and the like, um, but we're dealing with terrorism, right? And how people respond to terrorism and how we make assessments about that, right? So think about the availability heuristic for a moment, right? And people use this to make decisions, to drive our decisions in society. Right? President Bush, not long after 9-11, proposed that we go to war in Iraq. Why? There are a number of reasons, but one of which he gave in a speech here in Ohio, I believe, was some citizens wonder, after 11 years of living with this problem, why do we need to confront it now? There is a reason. We have experienced the horror of September 11th. Right? Plain and simple. Right? And, I'm, again, and so immediately, that's a utilization of the availability heuristic. People conjure up this image and many others of 9-11. And it affects people's own determinations of the risk, of the likelihood of some sort of harm befalling us. Um, a number of studies have been done this, right, uh, on, on these issues. Consider, consider this study. This was actually a study that came out before 9-11. When people were asked how much they will pay for flight insurance for losses resulting from terrorism, people were willing to pay more for such insurance than if they were asked how much they will pay for flight insurance from all causes. Now, perhaps given more time to think about that, right, maybe they would realize that that all causes is encompassing of terrorism. But the, answer, the answers are telling, right? Terrorism does have an impact on our thinking. And it can, in fact, that intuitive response, um, what, what some uh, uh, scholars have called system one, right, will, will over-determine what your system two, what your reasoning, what your deliberative faculties might consider. Going back to the car and, uh, and plane issue, consider that after 9-11, tens of thousands of people chose not to fly. 
right? Not now, after the first few days when there was, uh, when basically the skies were rendered planeless, um, people chose not to fly. As a result, right, studies have been done that suggest that there were more than 300 more fatalities uh, during the three month period following 9-11 than in the five years preceding, right? Directly attributable to the increase in car traffic over plane traffic, all right? Uh, consider another study, right? And this suggests the contagion effect of 9-11. Uh, adolescents were asked before 9-11, um, before 9-11, right? What, what are your fears? Uh, and, and, and what do you think is the likelihood um, that you might die by a tornado? Before 9-11, adolescents answered 34% chance. After 9-11, the chance of dying by a tornado, 64%. Right. Adolescents asked before 9-11, what is the chance of dying by an earthquake? They answered 25%. After 9-11, 42%. So it infects the way we think and we assess all risks differently. Uh, finally, a, a study that I think has a lot of significance uh, here for both policymakers, and I include judges within policymakers. Uh, judges do, uh, inevitably, particularly I think in areas of terrorism, a number of other areas where there's not always an obvious answer, they're utilizing common sense, they are also making policy. Um, so researchers asked individuals, uh, participants in a study, What's the best approach? If, the, if DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is going to allocate money, they can only choose one strategic approach to stopping terrorism, should they allocate their money to preventing uh, highly likely events or high consequence events, right? events that will have significant loss but aren't as probable? Two-thirds of people chose what you might call the normative approach. They chose the more probable event. Right? But then an additional study asked participants, if you're going to blame the government, when will you hold the government more blameworthy? For when there is a high consequence event or when there is a more probable event? And what do you think the majority of respondents answered? The high consequence event. Right? So then there was a study done with individuals who make uh, risk determinations. And they asked, to what degree will you factor in the blameworthiness? Right? What, how will that factor in? Will you make probability determinations or will you take into account the blameworthiness? And the experts overwhelmingly answered they were going to take into account the blameworthiness. Right? So the answer from that, what we can take, right, is that policymakers are rightly, right, many of them, uh, accepting federal judges, right, are going to be voted into office. Right? They, they have to answer to the people. Um, and so that blameworthiness factors inevitably into their decisions. Um, so judicial risk assessments. Judges are, as many studies suggest, not all that different from the rest of us, from, from, from lay people, right? They're human, they bleed, they feel, um, and they're just as susceptible to emotional uh, and concomitant cognitive errors as anyone else. Uh, there was a fascinating study done of, of Florida judges. So we, we can't make any determination here in Ohio about these judges, but Florida trial judges in which they scored on various cognition tests virtually the same uh, as, as lay people. Um, and a, a very interesting study came out, uh, I guess it was published last year, uh, looking at Israeli judges, uh, and in particular parole judges. Um, and the study found that, uh, to use the phrase, that you are what you eat for breakfast. Right? Uh, judges, uh, they, all they were doing all day was deciding parole. And generally, the default position was you're going to deny parole, deny parole. When were they most likely to grant parole? After eating. After breakfast, after lunch, and after a snack. Right? So uh, again, you know, we are all flesh and blood. And we're going to be subject to certain emotional things, to our appetite, to our satiation. Uh, it's hard to avoid. Um, and there's certainly a historical record, though. Uh, for seeing that courts and policymakers, but courts are also susceptible uh, to these various emotional stimuli and to cognitive errors. Um, maybe one of the most famous examples in very sorry chapters in our history is Korematsu. Um, this is the Japanese internment case. Um, this case, of course, occurred immediately in the wake of the, the Pearl Harbor attack. Right? The United States went to war. A terrible time of fear and terror, uh, worry of the security of the United States, and particularly 
I suppose, on the West Coast. And so there were many calls almost immediately for, we need to get rid of the Japanese, right, was what people were calling for, um, and, and suggesting that there were imminent threats all along. Um, no, no less a uh, uh, historical figure as, as J. Edgar Hoover, however, called the idea of mass evacuation of Japanese based entirely on public hysteria. Right? Hoover was not, at least in this instance, a proponent of this act activity. Um, and yet, in 1942, President Roosevelt signed uh, an executive order ordering that all people of Japanese extraction be removed from sensitive areas on the West Coast. What's fascinating is, during the congressional hearings, there were generals who said, there is no evidence of Japanese-American espionage. There's no intelligence about an imminent threat. Um, and one, one of the wonderful reasonings of why this was necessary, right, was because there has been no act of sabotage, that means it's coming. Right? There, right, it's, it's imminent. Right? The, the lack of anything suggests that something is coming. Right? And so society was uh, really in an uproar. Another amazing thing, and I, I did not know this because I was looking into this, um, in Hawaii, where the attack on Pearl Harbor actually occurred, there was not internment of Japanese. Right? So, so even the logic, the military necessity of all this sort of calls into question. So eventually, Fred Korematsu is walking down the street in California in violation of the order. He is arrested and convicted of violating this order. And the Supreme Court upholds the conviction, six to three. Um, and indeed, what they essentially say is, we can't reject as unfounded the military's decision. Right? We are not in a place to question this. There is the possibility, in essence, of disloyalty. There is the possibility of an attack. And we're not going to look any further beyond the evidence. We are not going to push beyond the assertions of the military authorities. Because we could not reject the finding of the military authorities that it was impossible to bring in about an immediate segregation of the disloyal from the loyal, we sustained a validity of a curfew order in Herbayashi, a case that preceded this. Um, and similarly, they're not going to question the temporary exclusion of an entire group. Um, and perhaps, perhaps, if you wanted to, to find some kernel of hope there, right, was the notion of the temporary exclusion, right? A general view that war is short term. Justice Douglas, who joined the majority, said later uh, that this was one of his great regrets, that he had bowed to the other elders of the court, um, but noted members of the court are very much a part of the community, and they know the fears, anxieties, cravings, and wishes of their neighbors. The state of public opinion will often make the court cautious when it should be bold, right? So again, the court is not ignorant and is not uh, insensitive to public opinion and feels some of those fears just as anyone else would. Seven years later, World War II is over, but we are in the midst of the Cold War. McCarthyism is running rampant. You have the Red Scare. Um, country was consumed with exposing communists. Alger Hiss is revealed, or at least initially exposed, right, to be a communist, to have passed on information. Right? There are indeed communists. We have the blacklist. We have the House on Un-American Activities Committee looking into Hollywood. Right? There are communists. And we are indeed in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. But the fear is at an incredible level. In 1949, China falls to the communists. Right? The world is changing. People are terrified. And against this backdrop, we have the case of the United States versus Dennis that is brought. Uh, in 1948, the case is brought against 12 members of the Communist Party of the United States, including Eugene Dennis, who is the Secretary General of the Communist Party. And the charge is a violation of the Smith Act. Essentially, what have they done? Listen carefully. They have conspired to advocate the duty and necessity of overthrowing the government by force and violence. They weren't indicted for attempting to overthrow the government. They weren't indicted for advocating the overthrow of the government. They were charged with conspiring to advocate the overthrow of government. All right, so we accept maybe that the harm is quite great there, the overthrow of the government. But what is the probability? You're pretty far removed, right? And sounds very far from what maybe the clear and present danger test or what you think of as Brandenburg right now. Where is the imminence, right? Where is the likelihood that this action will take place? Um, and just to, to conjure up now and move a little bit, thinking about when we, we talk about our fears of prosecuting terrorism here in the United States, there were 400 police around the Foley Square courthouse 
right? People were terrified of what was going to happen. Right? Security was everywhere. The trial lasted nine months, 16,000 pages right, of a record. Um, and the jury found each one, each member of, of the, uh, who, was, who was indicted, guilty and sentenced them to five years. Um, and on the Second Circuit, no less than Judge Learned Hand uh, upheld the convictions. Um, and he formed, uh, looking back at the clear and present danger test that had been formulated by Holmes and Brandeis and trying to make sense of it, uh, came up with this, the first paragraph. In each case, courts have to ask whether the gravity of the evil, discounted by its improbability, justifies such invasion of free speech as is necessary to avoid the danger. Right? So you sort of have perhaps an inverse relationship. The more terrible the harm, right, the less perhaps probability we are worried about in terms of justifying an infringement of free speech. And a Supreme Court, uh, which upheld the conviction six to two, adopted this reasoning, this test in a plurality, um, and revealing how much it feared the threat of communism, said, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to wait until a, a push is, is uh, about to be executed, until there's an overthrow? The plans have been laid and the signal is awaited. If government is aware that a group aiming at its overthrow is attempting to indoctrinate its members, and to commit them to a course whereby they will strike when the leaders feel the circumstances permit, action by the government is required. Right? And, and, and indeed, I mean, the, the concurrence by Justice Jackson, and it's fascinating how justice has changed on the court. Justice Jackson was one of the justices who objected uh, to Korematsu. He dissented vehemently. Here, to read his concurrence, and some you know, suppose that some of this had to do with his role in prosecuting Nazis, um, as a, a, a vitriolic fear of, of, of communism. I mean, they become almost sort of this, these, these super people who can do, do devastating damage. Um, and uh, and, and so, so they are indeed convicted. Uh, Justice Black, who did author Karamatsu, comes out against. He is in dissent in this case, and in fact wrote, uh, I guess, in the margins of a draft from uh, the Chief Justice Vincent, who, who wrote this opinion, uh, good semantic emotionalism and conjuring up of ghosts. Uh, emergency, crisis, always the plea of those who would give dictatorial powers to rulers, right? So you have the justices really, you know, uh, attacking each other and saying essentially that they are, they are to some degree fear-mongering, right? And arguably it's not until 1969 when we have the Brandenburg decision that there's really clarity uh, about this clear and present danger uh, decision saying that you, you can't prescribe, you can't prohibit advocacy um, unless it's directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is indeed likely to produce that action. Um, so I want to move forward now to the post 9-11 terrorism cases. Um, a lot, you know, the initial or the dominant popular narrative of many of these cases has been um, that the courts struck a, a blow for the law and, and, and the government, the executive, uh, was shut down on its, on its excesses in terms of dealing with terrorism. And, and to be sure, there were indeed some decisions um, in which the government did not get precisely what it wanted, in which it asserted that the court does indeed have a role. Um, I would submit, however, that it has not been quite the victory that often has been popularly portrayed. Um, now, part of that is because, to some extent, the executive took some extreme positions, often saying, uh, the executive can act unilaterally in a war, and we are in a war. Um, and generally, the court either struck down that or, or really avoided that issue. Right? And so they were sort of more marginal opinions. But if you think about um, the Hamdi decision, uh, this is Hamdi versus Rumsfeld. This involved a Saudi national, American born, so he was a citizen, uh, who was captured in Afghanistan, brought to Guantanamo, and then interrogators realized, wait, he's an American. So they sent him to the Charleston Naval Brig in South Carolina, where he was still declared an enemy combatant, and the government asserted they can hold him indefinitely as an enemy combatant and don't need to give him a lawyer, doesn't need to go before a court. So what did the Supreme Court do? The Supreme Court, in, in a more fractured opinion than people often appreciate, right, upheld the detention of Mr. Hamdi as pursuant to an authorization of military force by Congress. Right? That is to say, detention is an incident of hostilities, and this can be done, even with an American citizen. However, and where it did push back at the government, Mr. Hamdi is entitled to some sort of hearing, and the court did not specify what, before a neutral fact finder. 
right, and actually used the Matthews v. Eldridge analysis um, in this quasi-criminal war-like context, right? Needs some sort of hearing. Um, so what has happened eventually, actually I should say, eventually Mr. Hamdi did go home. He actually was repatriated um, and I believe signed some sort of agreement saying he would never ever be allowed to return to the United States, um, but also was found to not really be all that much of a threat either. Um, but what has happened with this Hamdi opinion, which was often held to be such a great victory um, uh, for the law, is that the executive, through the Bush administration and the Obama administration, cites Hamdi for the proposition uh, that they can detain individuals well beyond what arguably was thought of in the authorization of use of military force for just Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces, but as an authority to detain individuals who are supporting terrorism, who are supporting forces hostile to the United States. Um, and that has continued to be cited to this day. Um, a few more opinions. You know, a lot obviously re re uh, related to Guantanamo. Right? Guantanamo was certainly first conceived as a place where, where no law would apply. Um, in an earlier uh, Guantanamo decision that for various reasons began in the Ninth Circuit, um, the government lawyer at one point asserted uh, in response to some questioning by Judge Reinhardt uh, that the government could actually summarily execute someone at Guantanamo and the, and the court would have no jurisdiction over that. Right? So they were taking some pretty extreme contentions about what could be done at Guantanamo and what role the court had. Well, the court doesn't always react so well to being told, you have nothing to say here. Right? Um, and so uh, in, in, in uh, Rasul, the court six to three held that uh, pursuant to the habeas statute, uh, the court did have jurisdiction and challenges to the legality of detention could be brought. Didn't speak to what processes could be brought, didn't speak to what substantive rights the detainees had, that was it. And Justice Stevens, in his opinions, took pains to suggest that's all that I'm talking about. Justice Kennedy um, under, undertakes a little bit of a risk analysis. Right? He suggests that given that they have been detained already for about two years at this point in 2004, how much military necessity could there really be? What, what, what in essence, is the real threat of there being jurisdiction? And Justice Scalia, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, has a colorful response. Um, he suggests that this is complicating the present war, uh, potentially harmful effect on the nation's conduct of the war, and judicial adventurism of the war sort. So let's go on that adventure. Right? What, what, what happens? Um, a number of things do occur following uh, Rasul. The government does implement some sort of rudimentary procedure based on Rasul and Hamdi. Um, they're called combatant status review tribunals. Uh, the individual does not have a lawyer, but has a personal representative in which there's no confidentiality, and can indeed make some sort of statement though the detainee is not apprised really of any intelligence against him. Um, the Congress amends the habeas statute to say that there is no habeas for detainees at Guantanamo. And they do this through the Military Commissions Act. Um, and so we come to uh, the Bomedian decision. Right. This is essentially, for all intents and purposes, Rasul Part Two, Rasul the sequel. Right? Detainees are still held at Guantanamo, still hundreds of them there. And the argument brought by the detainees right, is essentially, we have been stripped of habeas and that the CSRTs, these combatant status review tribunals, are not a sufficient substitute for habeas. That in essence, habeas corpus has been suspended. And the court rules in a five to four decision uh, that detainees have a constitutional right to habeas. Um, and indeed, uh, Justice Kennedy delivers what has certainly been the, the longest, very long, disquisition on habeas. Uh, habeas scholars were thrilled. It's like a valentine to habeas. Um, but you know, it, it's, not, it's not always a very, very clear uh, opinion. Um, you know, you would think, and at one point it, it would seem fairly explicit, right? Part of habeas is that the court could order release of the detainee. Um, but there's first of all this language, right? Sort of negating the danger because they're not released. So somehow they're not a danger, but isn't that really what we're talking about? And then there's language in the opinion um, which suggests release, not suggests, he says, release need not be the exclusive remedy and is not the appropriate one in every case in which the writ is granted. And again, in terms of military necessity, now we're, we're six years later on at Guantanamo, 
And so both Justice Kennedy and Justice Souter in a concurrence say, you know, this six years is just way too long. How, how much urgency could there be? Well, Justice Scalia, as you might imagine, is, uh, is fairly apoplectic uh, over this. Um, you know, he, he's written some colorful opinions, uh, some over the Im immigration law uh, in Arizona, got a lot of attention this past year. But um, this one, and maybe you recall it, uh, got a fair bit of attention. Um, America is at war with radical Islamists, he argues. Um, and he invokes, uh, this, this is an image of the Marine barracks bombings in Lebanon in 1982. Um, and he goes on to give a little bit of a history of America's war with terrorism. And it's an interesting set of facts because to some extent, this is not simply a history of the war with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. He begins with, in fact, Shiite extremists, Hezbollah, right, as opposed to the Sunni extremists in, uh, in, in Al-Qaeda, and goes through uh, a, a quite vivid uh, history, uh, and indeed talks about how we're still on the battle. And, and this, this opinion, and he goes even further, is making us in peril. It's putting us in peril. Right? It will cause more Americans to be killed. Um, really quite vitriolic language. Um, and, and ironically, you know, he accuses Justice Kennedy of faux deference, right? suggesting um, you know, you're, 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 you're saying you're not expert and you're deferring to the executive and to Congress. You hardly are. Um, and yet, Justice Scalia's opinion is replete with its own set of fact findings, uh, something that judges do a lot, not always, I think, willing to perhaps admit. Um, what's the aftermath of Bomedian? Um, the district court, now admittedly, Justice Kennedy does not give much direction to the courts below as to what and how to review these habeas petitions. And indeed, Chief Justice Roberts really rips into Justice Kennedy for that, um, noting that uh, you know, really what you've done is you're just laying a marker for the court. Right? This is a turf battle. And you're really going to make things, in fact, you're not going to make things any better for the detainees. And to some extent, uh, there, there, there's certainly um, a bit of prophecy that would seem to have come true. District court judges do, in many cases, um, order the release of detainees. Um, but the D.C. Circuit overturns those. The D.C. Circuit sort of stands as the bulwark uh, against any release. They have never uh, affirmed a grant of habeas. And, and so where do things stand now? And, and also they, they, they crafted a lot of rules that were generally presumptions in favor of the government. So where do we stand now? What does Justice Kennedy do about this? Right? There must have been petitions filed right, seeking certiorari. Yeah, there were seven last year. And the court rejected every one of them without a dissent. Right? Not ready to revisit Guantanamo. Uh, and I don't forecast them doing so anytime soon. Um, so uh, another case. Uh, this is a more recent case and often isn't thought about uh, as a war on terrorism case. And in part because it does not involve Al-Qaeda, uh, it does not involve the Taliban, it does not involve those detainees. But here it is occurring in 2010. And it occurs undoubtedly in the shadow, under the specter, of 9-11 of terrorism. And in this case, this is a pre-enforcement challenge right, to the material support statute. Um, and a 6-3 to three majority, Chief Justice uh, Roberts writes the opinion, Justice Stevens joins him in this one, held that prohibiting teaching international humanitarian law for peaceful purposes to foreign terrorist groups did not, as applied to the plaintiffs, violate the First Amendment. Um, and so an issue in this case is the material support statute. What is that, that law? It makes it a federal crime to knowingly provide material support or resources to a foreign terrorist organization. Um, so who, who are the plaintiffs in this case? Uh, one of them is the group Humanitarian Law Project. Here's their mission, right? Dedicated to protecting human rights and promoting the peaceful resolution of conflict by using established international human rights laws and humanitarian law. Right? And they're working in, in the corridors of Congress and in the UN. What, 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 could, what could we object to here? Right? Um, and look, look, here's, here's the president. Right? Ralph Ferdig, a professor of social work at the University of Southern California. Social work! Right? Well, the problem is, of course, he wants to teach international humanitarian law and human rights law to who? To the PKK, right? a foreign designated uh, terrorist organization dedicated to the independence of Kurdistan in Turkey, right? a violent group. 
And others, other plaintiffs, wanted to help out. Essentially, the oh, sorry, um, uh, the LTTE, the, the Liberation Tigers of uh, Tamil Elam, right? Seeking independence for groups in Sri Lanka. Okay, so these are not nice people, and I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be flip here, right? Dangerous folks, right? But they wanted to teach, uh, you know, political advocacy, human rights, peaceful, peaceful stuff, if you will. Um, so what does the what does the what does the majority do? All right, they recognize well this sure does sound like speech, right? And pretty darn close to political speech, right? So what level of scrutiny do you normally get? You get strict scrutiny. Well, the court seems a little uncomfortable with that. We're not going to quite call it that. So this is providing material support in the form of speech. It's going to get some something. It's not strict scrutiny. It's not conduct. Uh, it, it's something else. It falls somewhere in between, right? And what's the interest? Right? There's a compelling interest, obviously. You want to stop terrorism. You want to stop uh, these actions that the Secretary of State has determined are, in fact, terrorist activities. Um, so what's the real issue before the court, then? What are they analyzing? Um, whether foreign terrorist organizations meaningfully segregate support of their legitimate activities from support of terrorism, right? Sort of a fungibility issue. If, I give, if you're giving some sort of support to a terrorist organization, that's going to free up other resources, the government argues. Right? And so you are helping then the terrorist organizations right? because of this fungibility, right? sort of a, a la money. Right? And that's sort of the argument. You give money to a terrorist group, you give money to Hezbollah, they can use that money for, for terrorist activities. Right? But here, it's, it, and here, in, in, in the dissent by Justice Breyer really pushes back and says, wait, wait a minute, how does teaching about conducting a ceasefire uh, under the Geneva Conventions how is that fungible, right? What, is, what does that free up? Um, the other argument that the government makes is, is sort of a legitimating one, a tainting one, right? What this will do, if you teach them human rights and international humanitarian law, they're going to look more reputable, right? They're going to be more legitimated. And so that's going to mean they can get more money. They can then do a lot more fundraising. And in fact, they can even recruit more terrorists because they really want to be part of this good organization that obeys human rights law and international humanitarian law, right? And and also, uh, and they argue, we need to defer to the executive here, right? Which is, again, this continual refrain of, of, of deference, right? And, and in part because we're dealing with terrorism, right? And, and this is really difficult stuff, and we're not competent to handle it, but we're also not going to require any concrete evidence. We're not going to require anything hard and really conclusive evidence as to this connection between teaching international humanitarian law and this leading to and supporting terrorist activities. And we're not going to acquire that highest standard. All the while arguing that this is deference, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, also of his own accord, this is not in the record, it's not submitted by the government in any way, finds a book, or his clerk does. Right? So again, you think of sort of a availability heuristic. I don't know where they got the book. On Amazon, they went to their library. Blood and Belief by Eliza Marcus, and I'm not in any way trying to denigrate the book, but Chief Justice Roberts all of a sudden cites nine pages from this book about the PKK and notes that previously they in fact have entered ceasefires and then entered into violent activities again. The reasoning follows by Chief Justice Roberts is, well, if you teach them international humanitarian law, they could in fact enter another ceasefire and then, aha, engage in another attack. So you are indeed helping them. You are indeed providing material support. And his evidentiary standard seems this possibility is real, not remote. Right? We're giving in to our fears um, and, our, and our, our darkest concerns. So, so what are we going to do about all of this? Um, I, I, I suggest a number of things um, really fast. Hopefully you caught all that. Um, uh, and I'm going to get to the first one in a moment, but let, let me deal with the others, right? One of which is still, I think we have a concern when we're dealing with terrorism, um, that the, the government is going to overreact for many of the reasons that I've laid out, uh, not the least of which is to curry public favor, but it is also a fear and perhaps overstating the threat. Um, if we're going to do so, and often, in fact, who are we more willing to subject to limitations? Well, not me, not you, right? But the other, right? And so we're, we're worried, in fact, uh, about civil liberties, about unpopular opinions. We're worried about minority groups who can be targeted and are not going to have uh, the, as large a constituency. Um, and so I argue that any restrictions on civil liberties should be authorized by Congress. 
Um, there should be a special scrutiny for measures that are going to restrict, in particular, minority groups. Uh, we need what's called second order balancing. Right? So that means, right, just, just real quickly, um, you're not going to do ad hoc balancing, just these one-off ones. Right? You can have one of the very popular arguments, and it's debated at many dinner tables, Thanksgiving, what have you, right, is uh, you've got the ticking time bomb. You should torture that terrorist. Right? Um, without getting into the merits of that argument, second order balancing says we're not going to look at that individual instance. We're going to look at it in a larger picture and see what are, as it were, to some extent, the pros and cons. What is the impact of engaging in such a policy at a larger level? Um, finally, clear rules, evidentiary presumptions. And then I just want to go back to emotional honesty. What I am asking for, and what many scholars looking at judges have, have done, is saying, please be honest. Right? Acknowledge that these things are difficult, that these are hard decisions to make. Um, don't dress up your decisions in fact findings that are, in fact, most likely a product of the availability heuristic or probability neglect. Right? Demand some of this clarity from Congress, in particular from the President. Um, but note the difficulty of these things, because I think the message that the court can send, and the court sends an important message uh, to the public, we are affected by their decisions, by the opinions on the bench, um, is to note the difficulty of these things, to note that there are not easy answers. Um, you know, real, real quickly, uh, um, Justice Hoffenauer, and I, I hope I'm presenting, uh, pronouncing that correctly, um, very recently, just last month, um, on his third try, uh, delivered a sentence of uh, uh, Ahmed Rassam, who was the Millennium Bomber. You might remember he, uh, he wanted to uh, blow up the LAX, the Los Angeles International Airport. Um, and he noted in sentencing uh, Mr. Rassam to 37 years in prison, the government had wanted life imprisonment, um, that this case provokes our greatest fears, but um, fear should never be the guide for us. We need to follow those rules. Uh, that it is a foul ingredient for the sentence in calculus. I think it is also a foul ingredient uh, for really any determination by the judge. Um, and with that, and I apologize for rushing through, I'd be happy to entertain questions. Yes, sir. Part question and part little story that might be interesting to you. Uh, my wife and I were survivors of the First World Trade Center bombing. <clears throat> we walked on 107 flights in 1993. And as a lawyer and as a participant in walking down that and watching the events of that and seeing the horror and everything, I was particularly interested in following the quick apprehension of the people that caused that bombing. We all know the story of that. But what we don't all know, and the reason we didn't know it, and that's why I want to raise it for you in your comment, is why were we not, as a society, more alarmed, more concerned, and more knowledgeable about the risks that were then known, really known? Part of it was the press, I think. A comment I would make as to why it was the press and why it was the public. The American public, in general, throughout history, acts when there's an emergency, a real emergency. Well, that was a pretty big emergency, and that was a pretty big bell ringer. But if you'll all remember, what were we focused on as a society during the days when the terrorists in that non-1993 bombing were being tried in the courtroom of Judge Kevin Duffy in New York? I used to look with difficulty to find the events of those days. Why? We were obsessed with the trial of O.J. Simpson. <coughs> if you'll remember, that was the reason. That's my opinion, why? Mm -hmm. And the politicians, the Congress, presidents in both parties, they didn't do enough early enough because we had it. And when you made the comment during your early comments there about uh, uh, what was more important, the probability of an event or the magnitude of the event, I think, whatever yeah. your words were. But that brought that to mind for me. Would that fit in with what you were thinking? And yeah, I, I, mean, I, mean, I, think, I, I think it does. I mean, I think, I mean, you present, I mean, sort of a great question. And in some respects, it's the flip side of, of what I'm talking about, right, is that I think um, probability neglect, as I mentioned at one point, does work both ways. Right? People can overstate the risk of something, they can understate. Right? We're not good at predicting one way or the other. The balance of that, right, in terms of determining what is the degree of harm that could occur and the likelihood of it, is a very difficult equation. Um, whether, you know, and the government, in part, has a decision to make. Right? Obviously, putting, putting the public sentiments aside, you know, to what degree does the government decide to undertake some of those assessments? Do we need?
everything to be immediately in front of us every day on the screen to get the public to do things, um, and maybe so. Yes? Has anybody criticized, I don't need this. It's Has anybody fantastic. criticized uh, Justice Roberts for the, the one opinion in which he seemed to do fact finding at the appellate level? He finds this book and he makes some findings that, oh, there's been some action by this group to enter into ceasefires and then they commit attacks. He's making some fact finding at the appellate level that probably should have gone at the trial court level. I'm not sure what standard is. Right, 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 absolutely. So, so yes, I mean, the short answer is there has been criticism. To be fair to Chief Justice Roberts, such fact-finding uh, in this instance is not, is not an isolated one, right? The court, the court does it, both sides do it all the time, right? And indeed, people have, have called that into question, though, right? Because if it's not part of the record, you don't have both sides being able to argue both ends of it, right? I mean, in, you know, in terms of really then, in theory, right, our system of government is to at least see both sides of the evidence, we're going to hash it out and figure out which is correct. So it's problematic there that that action, that fact-finding by Chief Justice Roberts has been criticized, but it's not an isolated instance. It, it occurs in all sorts of areas of the law. <clears throat> yes? You started off with cases that <clears throat> discussed sort of the fear of, of injury and harm, you know, Korematsu, things like that. Um, if you go with the sort of traditional definition of terrorism as trying to instill fear, um, do you think that this means essentially that the, terrorism, the terrorist goals have been successful because essentially what you're saying is that there's a, they, they've instilled fear in even our judiciary and has any of, the, have any of the courts sort of addressed the fact that they might be reacting fearfully to people who are intending to create fear? Yeah, I, there, there's some of that in, in Justice Breyer's dissent actually mm -hmm. in Humanitarian Law Project, right? And, and part of what, and you know, my, my solutions, I don't know that entirely are so novel, but for the emotional honesty piece, right? He, he's arguing, I, I'm insisting on conclusive evidence. Right? We're not going to give in to speculation here. Right? You're, you're telling me that this is going to legitimate uh, the PKK and then cause more terrorism. I'm, I'm asking for more evidence, right, is, is, what, is what Breyer says. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, there's, there's some dialogue there with, with, uh, with sort of this notion that the fears have won. Have, have the terrorists won in the sense of sowing fear in our society? Um, I don't know what degree the court has spoken about that, but, but to be sure, Right? We have undergone a revolution in terms of the resources that we allocate. Billions, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars have been added, out, allocated to counterterrorism, not including the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Right? So certainly our society has changed. Whether that's too far a tilt, whether the money has been allocated in the right way, you know, I leave that for all of you to, to decide. Well, I could go through a few more slides, but I think um, uh, I thank you all for coming. I'd like to just remind you that, again, Jessica Berg is speaking next month on December 12th on charity care obligations in tax-exempt hospitals. Time for a change. Have a very good day. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.